Mental health refers to our cognitive, behavioral, and emotional well-being. It's in the way we think, feel, and behave. The coronavirus is drastically taken over the world, sending the world into fear and panic. In light of this, what does it mean mentally, especially for those who have mental disorders? It's a good day to you all. My name is Runako Biotisilindiwa, and welcome to Mental Health Focus. Today on the show, we'll be talking about panic and anxiety disorders. To learn more about this, we have invited Cynthia, who's a mental wellness coach. Cynthia, welcome to the show, and you can introduce yourself. So I'm C the coach. I am a mental wellness coach, and what I work with is really anyone who is struggling with issues of stress, um, anxiety, and mental and emotional health that is not in a really good state. So I help people get to a better state of mental well-being. And this is not through medicine, but it's through like different coaching techniques and different counseling methods as well. That's really what I do, and that's who I am. Thank you for coming through to the show. My first question would be, what are panic attacks? So a panic attack is really when one gets to a state of panic or usually linked to anxiety, um, and they are physically, their body starts to react to this process that's happening in the brain. So your mind is going in overdrive and you're stressed and you're getting into almost hysterics and your body starts to physically respond to that. So for some, they, they feel the um, a, a racing of their heart, heart rate. And so some actually then get difficulty breathing as well. And which leads to a lot of people then gasping for air and some could collapse, but usually it's, it's almost like when someone's having an asthma attack, you know, that um, gasping for air and struggling to, to calm down. That's really what happens in a panic attack. You mentioned anxiety disorders. Do they go hand in hand with panic attacks? Yes, a lot of um, panic attacks, a lot of people who suffer from panic attacks, some people may have a diagnosed um, anxiety disorder, some may not. It's not everyone who's got something, a mental illness that is diagnosed that suffers from panic attacks. But when you do have anxiety, you're more prone to it because a lot of things unsettle you and a lot of things can get you into a state of hysterics and a state of extreme panic where you can't control it. And that's why some of them end up having to be medicated. So they can moderate their heart rate and it's not racy all the time and they are more settled in their breathing as well. How do you define anxiety disorders? They are more linked to anxiety. It's when you are not in a state of calm. When one has an anxiety disorder, it's not like they stress a lot more than the others, but it's when you can't cope with that level of stress. I think as people regularly, we have a certain threshold of how much stress we can go through and how much um, worry we can experience without losing it. But when someone has an anxiety disorder, it becomes a debilitating uh, process in your mind. So in psychology, when we describe something as be being a disorder, the reason, the thing that makes it a disorder and not a normal process in your brain is the fact that it's now affecting your everyday life. Your everyday functionality as a person is now disrupted because of this disorder. So with anxiety disorders, it's a debilitating state of panic, of anxiety, of worry, where everything that is listed within what causes that anxiety for you causes you to worry extremely not in the normal dosage that a regular person would experience. But because it's now a debilitating one, it's extreme all the time. That's what happens during an, a, a disorder. 
what could be the triggers for panic attacks? Okay, in this environment right now, I think there's a lot of triggers to panic attacks and a lot of triggers to a lot of mental health issues because there's just the the thought that being in contact, in physical contact with a loved one could make you sick and you don't know what that sickness can do to you. That could get you into a panic attack. It could get you into a state of extreme panic because you're anticipating all the worst case scenarios. It's hard to then come back and try to calm down because they're not enough facts for us to rely on to say, we're going to all be okay. The truth is we're not all going to be okay, but just that thought can lead someone into extreme panic and into an extremely frightful state all the time. What coping mechanisms can be used? So what I advise for, for anyone who has a medically proven or medically diagnosed condition, they are probably on, on medication for it and they can obviously see um, the psychiatrist treating them for best measures in that scenario. But what I'd advise to every other regular person who's experiencing this panic and this um, anxiety is let's, we can do a number of things. Uh, one of them is journaling. Journaling is a good way of putting down your thoughts. Keep a diary or something that you write down your thoughts, express yourself, what you're thinking about what's going on. It's good to express ourselves. When we bottle up our emotions, we struggle with them. Um, another thing you could do is talking to someone. Find someone who's safe to talk to. When I say someone is safe to talk to, I mean someone who will not judge you for the way you're feeling, someone who will not um, mock you for it or insult you for feeling the way you're feeling. So find a safe person to speak to who can at least hear you out and you can express yourself to that person. And I've also found being there for others is, is, is a really good coping mechanism for some people. Being there for your loved ones, calling, checking in on them, making sure everyone's okay, uh, checking if they've left the house or if they're staying in, what they're doing to keep them busy. It's a way of coping in, in this time. And I think one big thing I've been saying to people is social distancing doesn't mean emotional distancing. We need to be connecting emotionally. That's how we're going to get through this. So that's, those are some of the big things I would advise right now for anyone handling all this and trying to cope. Before being diagnosed with panic disorders, what patterns can we look at? Well, look, before you, you are diagnosed, um, you obviously uh, display different symptoms over a period of time. And those symptoms are what will then lead to a diagnosis. So I would say check your, especially your breathing, when you think of something or when you are experiencing something. Observe how your breathing is regular or it's irregular and take note of it. I think with any condition that you're not sure of, rather than going to Google first, <laughs> it's best we take down our symptoms and see a professional with what we're suspecting. So no, pay attention to how you're breathing, pay attention to what thoughts um, cause this, pay attention to whether it's in certain scenarios only that you're experiencing these feelings. Because as you breathe in a certain way, you also may be sweating or trembling. So there's a lot of physical responses to what starts to happen in your mind. And so that's what people have to pay attention to when they're trying to observe what's happening with them. Are men more susceptible than women to anxiety? Uh, not necessarily. It's, it's not proven that <laughs> any one gender is prone to this or that disorder. It's not something that you can really point to one person, one type of one gender to say this is what's meant for you or this is what you would most likely suffer from. What is the trend in cases of mental health issues in the recent years in Zimbabwe? 
we've had difficulty in tracking these numbers. You know, mental health is something that we don't even have enough resources to deal with in Zimbabwe. Currently, we have 15 psychiatrists tending to a population of over a million. So you can imagine what the ratio is there. And these 15 psychiatrists are having to diagnose patients, even if they were to see a, a, a thousand people a day, it still is like crazy how much they have to keep up with. But because of that, we are failing to track who has what and how they're being medicated. We also have issues of culture. Culture stops people from seeking help in issues of mental health because we want to talk about kuroiwa or the evil spirits or other things that are not necessarily scientific. So before someone gets treatment for a disorder, we're taking them to the church or we're taking them to a traditional healer. And I have no problem with people's religious practices, but sometimes it's something that just a bottle of pills can regulate that person and they're functional in society. But because we're not aware this is what we're doing in Zimbabwe. So I can't even give you proper statistics because we can't track, we can't even begin to track what's happening in our country. Has there been an increase in the people who are seeking mental health advice since the coronavirus? I think personally in, in the people that I deal with, I have seen a, an increase in people reaching out and trying to find ways of coping with how they're feeling right now. Because like I was saying, um, right now we have an, an issue where there are people with mental illnesses, yes, but there are people whose mental wellness has been affected. So the regular person like you and me, who has nothing that's diagnosed, but is now feeling extremely worried, extremely fearful, and we're in a state of panic because this is happening. All those people are now coming up because they're more stressed, they're more... Um, fearful and they're trying to find ways of processing all these emotions and feelings in the correct way. Uh, we're having to stock up on groceries and, and stay indoors and some are still going to work. All of those things are causing a lot of unrest in our emotional well-being. So I've seen a, a spike in the, in the people that, I, that approach me for help. And obviously, we can only do it remotely like what we're doing now. <laughs> I can't sit down with people like I usually do. What can we do as we quarantine to keep our mental health? Well, as we quarantine, I think good mental health is maintained by... I have different scenarios that I've sort of designed. And for yourself, take time to reflect. Journal, like I was saying, um, do some breathing exercises or read a book. Um, do what helps you to relax. So some people, it's reading a book, it's watching a show or it's, it's reading a magazine or drawing or painting. Some are planting gardens. That's a, that's a way to relax as an individual. As couples, I think it's important to connect, to have more conversations that are open and honest and have fun together. That's a really good thing. That's a really big thing. Uh, it's the same for families that have children. Connect with your children. Allow them to express their feelings about this. Allow them to talk about this. Give them the, the tips around it without making them scared of it. So give them information so that they are aware but not fearful. And for your extended family and friends, connect with them call Skype, um, do video calls, check up on each other. I think what makes us more fearful and um, anxious is not knowing how everyone's doing. So check up on each other more. I saw in, in countries like Italy where they're switching on the lights and going on their balconies to just try and sing a song or something, to try and feel connected to the next person. It's important for our mental health that we still feel connected to the world around us. That's the biggest thing. Can you recommend any apps or books? There's, there's a, a number of um, 
things that you can do. But, you know, I, I found even searching, just go and search fun indoor activities. <laughs> Type that in and so many things come up. You know, you have all these different um, puzzles that come up or activities or games, games like 30 seconds or charades where you're acting out something. These are different games. Or if you have board games in your house or card games, or you can build kites, go outside. Like in Zimbabwe, we've got the weather for it. Go outside leave your your kite in the air things like that seems simple but it's so relaxing (laughs) as we come to the end of the program what advice would you like to give to people out there to keep their mental health in check i think my my only thing is take care of yourselves um take care of each other and be well in this time it's it will come to pass it's just one of those tough things we just have to get through it together and we'll be okay on the other side thank you so much cynthia for coming through to the show it has been quite a learning experience and to the viewers out there thank you so much for watching keep on watching because more is to come this has been mental health focus see you next time